Hey, well, well th thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Green. Uh, thank you, Matt, for setting everything up here, the whole Leipzig team. Th thank you for all the other presenters who have just consulted me with all these different languages. I'm a language obsessive. It's been just so wonderful to see them all in use and see where you're going with them. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Classical Language Toolkit. Uh, I'm going to be giving you sort of a rundown of what it is, why I use it, and why I work on it, and then um, uh, something that's been in drilled into my head by, uh, by Greg and others, uh, I, I wanted to start from a research question uh, and get someplace. So I, what I decided to try to figure out, uh, if you're a Latin intermediate student and you wanted to uh, take Cicero on for yourself, how are you going to figure out what order to read? Okay, so uh, and just to find, can we figure out what Cicero's hardest sentence is uh, and, and what, what measurements do we have available to us to figure that out? Uh, a little background on why I would come to this question. Last summer, I was part of a, a syllabus building course uh, with Sinoikis, uh, and I was in a room full of Greek uh, professors, and we had, we had worked out the syllabus. Uh, it was Hellenistic poetry. We knew what we were going to read, uh, which authors, which works. Uh, we were all, the syllabus was done, except we needed to figure out how much to assign the students uh, per, uh, per class. And I will say in a room full of eight, nine professors, each person had a very specific idea of one, how much their student, and this is obviously some sort of idealized intermediate Greek student, how much their student could read, how long it would take them to read it, um, and then uh, what, what kind of uh, pace they would need per class per week. Um, we had eight professors in the room, probably with over 100 years of teaching experience, uh, and no one really could define why they believed uh, student, uh, what one, what what their student really, what how to define a student and and their abilities, uh, or no, but they all had just varying like I can read ten lines a week with my students, I can read twenty, twenty five. Uh, there were questions about efficiency, about effectiveness. Uh, there were <laughs> there was sort of an existential crisis at one point uh, along the lines of if it takes us an hour to read five lines of Callimachus, is it even worth assigning it to our students? Uh, so, as a matter of coincidence, during the summer while I was there, I happened to be working on uh, a, a project with uh, Google Summer of Code in which I was developing uh, a, a, an upgrade of the lemmatizers, the Latin and Greek lemmatizers that are available for the Classical Language Toolkit. And so I would be in the syllabus planning seminar during the day and I'd go back to uh, the, the, the room where I was staying at night and just look over statistic after statistic of Greek literature. So I'm in that room saying to the other professors, this is wonderful, you have all this anecdotal evidence of how much we can read, but you don't have, you have no data to prove it. And that, that made me think, I, not that I had the data, but I could get it, and I had a way of getting it. And, and this classical language toolkit was sort of my entry into that point. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the why. That's where I'm standing, starting from. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the Classical Language Toolkit. Uh, the Classical Language Toolkit is a free, open source uh, Python package that offers natural language processing support for uh, historical languages writ fairly broadly. Uh, it's a little bit of a um, well. It began from the ground up. All right, we. we we had uh, Kyle Johnson, who runs the, the project. He has a, a classics degree from NYU, so it started with uh, Greek and Latin. But as people uh, saw what we were doing and were interested in, uh, we weren't about to say no <laughs> if they wanted to bring their other historical languages in. Uh, so uh, we, we, depending on the language, we really have different uh, uh, time scales for, for when languages get introduced. Uh, so it runs roughly from the most ancient of languages through some uh, medieval uh, periods largely centered on the Mediterranean, but uh, in, in that sort of uh, grand scale Mediterranean that we've been talking <laughs> about all week. I'm really going from, uh, you know, the Spain that's to China in other respects, so I realize that's not really the Mediterranean. Uh, and the goal is to have language specific uh, tokenizers, sentence word tokenizer, paragraph tokenizers, whatever, uh, lemmatizers, POS taggers, uh, morphological parsers, uh, we want to make those uh, for as many of these languages as possible. And this is what I was talking about yesterday with this idea of the BLARC, the, the basic 
uh, language resource kit. Uh, we want to make sure that historical languages are, their historical languages tend to be what's called, quote, low resource languages that we don't have uh, out of the box. Um, tools for these languages, uh, we're trying to fill in those gaps. Uh, so we, we're an open source uh, community. We really think of it as uh, a people-driven project. Uh, you can see the CLTK work uh, on GitHub. Uh, as I said, it was founded by uh, Kyle Johnson, uh, who is uh, now working as a professional uh, natural language processing uh, uh, software engineer, research scientist. Uh, we have an academic uh, advisory board now, in, in which uh, uh, Professor Crane is part of. Uh, and I, I won't get a chance to talk about this at all today. Uh, I'm going to talk just about the, the toolkit part of it. We're also in the process of developing with what we're calling right now the CLTK archive, which is uh, a, a it's UI for the CLTK, uh, so a, a reader, um, a an interface for dealing with the. Uh, the I, I'm sort of trying to get away from this idea of critical editions, but but the 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 texts that are available, trying to come up with UI for them. The goals are to uh, just have analysis-friendly corpora. Uh, that's the, the, the lowest bar. So for whatever historical language you have, and I've seen so many today, and it'd be so great to include more, uh, more languages, more of you in the project, to get the corpora and data sets that we need. At a, we need to, <laughs> the tools will do nothing if we don't have the material to work on, right? Uh, right now, we have, um, it, it varies in, uh, in how much is covered, but uh, Latin, Greek are, are fairly well represented. Sanskrit is, is coming up. We have a good representation of Coptic. Um, uh, Egyptian, Hebrew, uh, we have some Tibetan, Pali, Telugu, uh, classical Chinese are all, uh, I would say, in their infancy. But uh, I, I su suspect uh, they'll, they'll be growing more soon. Uh, from there, what we want to do is collect and generate linguistic data based on this, uh, these data sets, uh, this idea of a quantified classics. Uh, and then the, the, high, uh, the high goal is to create an, an entire framework for integrated study of the ancient world. And I think that's what we're, and this is in the global philology mission, right? We want, once we have all the, the, the blarks, all the corpora for each language, uh, that's when the, I think the magic will happen where we're able to then uh, work between the languages at a, at a scale that's never uh, been possible before. Began in 2014, so it's a young, young organization. Uh, and this was a really pr uh, proud moment as I was making this slide. Uh, I basically borrowed this slide from uh, a presentation that Kyle had given at Big Ancient Mediterranean last summer. And uh, I just uh, had the chance to copy it and make the numbers go up, right? So uh, there were, we now have more commits on GitHub. We have more contributors, more people watching it and liking it. Uh, we're up to now 46 releases and um, Oh, this, this is important. Uh, we have DOIs for all the, re the releases. So if you want to uh, make uh, replicable research using um, either the data that's in CLTK, you can use your own, uh, or the, the tools, you want to you know which tool was used to run your data at what point in time, we have DOIs available uh, to, to cite. Uh, we have uh, a, a fairly good code coverage. We're, <laughs> we're uh, test driven to in, you know, we're, we're, we want to get things done, but we also want to get things done well. Uh, so 83% uh, is not so bad. Uh, the, the Mac and Unix support is, is, is pretty good. Uh, and the Windows is not so good. So uh, if you're doing historical language work in Windows, we'd, we'd actually really love to have you uh, aboard uh, contributing. Uh, and as I said, uh, I was one of the uh, two Google uh, Summer of Code participants from last summer. I did toolkit work. We had another person working on the archive. Um, it, was, it, was, it was sort of amazing to see Google put uh, some, some money uh, right on the table for uh, philo humanistic, philological, uh, computational work. So it was really, I think, uh, uh, a great sign for what uh, the CLTK uh, can contribute, what the value of it is. Uh, we're, we've just submitted the application for 2017. We're optimistic that we'll, we'll get a, at least one slot, hopefully two again. So if you have any students, or you're a student yourself, uh, for the next summer, and you have uh, an NLP project on a historical language that you would be willing to contribute to the CLTK, you, you, sh you should apply or, or persuade your students to apply. It's an amazing opportunity. Uh, my work, uh, specifically last summer, was uh, improving the lemmatizer. The lemmatizer that was out of the box in CLTK 
uh, was a largely a di dictionary based lemmatizer, uh, which was uh, had, on a good day, 84% accuracy. That wasn't sufficient for the work I was doing with some uh, corpus comparison work, some genre comparison, a little, a little bit of topic modeling. Uh, I would say that the, the, the machine learning lemmatizers that I've been reading about recently uh, seem to be topping out around 94, 95%. Uh, so that was a goal. I don't think that this lemmatizer is not there yet, but it's getting better. Uh, I created what's called a back-off lemmatizer. I used the Natural Language Toolkit uh, back-off POS tagging model uh, and applied it to a lemmatization task. And what I mean by that is that you can, it's, to call it a lemmatizer is a little misleading. It's actually a series of lemmatizers. And what it does is it, it can go through plain text uh, and on each pass, it decides whether or not uh, a lemma is valid. If it doesn't find a lemma on a single pass, it moves, it backs off, it goes to the next one and the next one, fully down the chain until it either returns or does not return uh, a lemma. I was able by the end of the summer in, uh, <laughs> you always have to qualify, in certain parts of Latin literature based on certain tests, I was pretty consistently getting around 91%. So that was a real increase uh, in, in what I could offer to this uh, CLTK. And so that was, a, that was a nice moment. For me, uh, I'm still not at 94%, uh, and, but the nice thing about the back-off system is that each one of those back-off uh, lemmatizers can be tuned, right? So some of them are, are, uh, are training data-based, some of them are dictionary-based, some of them are rules-based. Um, we, can, we can work together as a as research community to improve any one of those in the chain. We can also reorder the chain to find out the optimal uh, back-off sequence. I'm convinced that we can get this to, uh, 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 well, we can beat 95, that, that's the goal. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, and so to get back to the Cicero question, um, this, we just want to have, uh, again, uh, some research question. So uh, tool building for its own sake doesn't really have any uh, real level of, of intellectual satisfaction. What I wanted to do is use it to solve problems. This is a pretty low problem, I understand, uh, but it's a starting point and it's an, it's an understandable one. And uh, I just want to guide you through uh, some, some of what I was thinking based on that conversation uh, in Washington, D.C. at Synopsis this last year. Uh, I started to think, I started to dive into the in literature, almost entirely English-based literature. There's some of the other European languages on readability. Um, I'm just kind of starting from the uh, back and reading my way forward. Uh, but it seemed what I could really easily get now with uh, Python and then specifically the CLTK tools built on Python was I can get all of the statistics very quickly and with great efficiency uh, that are used for classic readability scores. Uh, and so here's a definition of readability from uh, two of the real um, uh, English um, uh, big, big names in readability. And we just wanted to get um, an idea of all of the things that go into uh, making sure that a reader can successfully navigate uh, something that is printed. Okay, they want to be able to understand it, read it at an optimum speed, and find it interesting. I don't think I'm quite an interesting yet. I'm starting to get a foothold on understand and speed. Uh, hundreds of features from text have been used in classic readability studies. Uh, to figure out what it is that makes something more or less readable. Uh, and consistently over, well, let's say, 40, 50 years of classic readability research, two features come out uh, to correlate with uh, ease and difficulty of reading consistently, and that is sentence complexity, almost always measured in uh, length, meaning either number of words or number of characters, and then lexical difficulty, that is uh, the relative percentage of easy words or hard words. And I realize there's a little bit of a chain problem there because now we have to define what easy and difficult words are. Um, and I'll also say that lexical difficulty is something that I think uh, classics, uh, Latin and Greek classics have been pretty good at over the last 20 years, especially. We, uh, it actually has a pretty rich tradition before that. Uh, we have actually quite a history of building word lists of free, free, you know, high frequency vocabulary uh, and uh, then um, for, for different authors, for different genres. So, so that, that's some place we're ahead. As far as the formal feature counting of simple statistic, uh, for simple sentence complexity, uh, there's, there's a lot less research than I expected to find. 
Uh, it was nice to see this uh, in a, a 17th century uh, uh, textbook, uh, the Sententiae Pura. Uh, this is Hull's uh, uh, Latin textbook, uh, one, of, one of his. Uh, and it was just nice to see sentence complexity addressed. This is one of the early pages of that, of that book, uh, where he just really breaks it down into sentences of one word, sentences of two words, sentences of three words. So uh, it, we're, we're, we have an introductory student who is, I, we're guessing, memorizing. It's hard to know how the books were, were used until you just get up to sentences of more words. Okay, So we actually have a textbook with, uh, it, it's fairly old, that shows this uh, idea of sentence complexity in ped pedagogical context. Uh, but, but we don't have to just look at this textbook. We have things like uh, the distics of Cato, which we see at the beginning of almost every ancient curriculum, uh, which actually begins with the monostics of Cato, one-liners. They were taught to students from the beginning. Uh, smaller sentences, less words, was just, you know, it's intuitive to uh, the classical pedagogical mind that those would be easier sentences to reckon with. Um, another idea I had was we have this uh, Ritchie's uh, fabulized Faculace, right? It's a 19th century reader of the stories of Ulysses and Hercules, right? Uh, and it's a hundred stories uh, with the uh, idea that story one is easier for a student to read than story 100. Uh, using formal features like the ones I described, uh, we actually do see that trend. <laughs> so it's nice to, uh, to see at least some uh, uh, um, confirmation that the, these assumptions that I'm dealing with in this talk uh, have some valid. We have a nice straight line up with average sentence length in Ritchie's. Uh, and even with Wheelock, a, a textbook that's used very commonly in the United States, uh, a 40 chapter textbook, it has some sententiae antiquae at the beginning, some uh, sentences from the ancient world. Uh, we do see a, a gradual um, increase in sentence length uh, and character per word uh, between chapter one and chapter 40. Actually, one interesting thing, just a real aside, is that uh, sentence length in Latin doesn't seem to correlate as well in English. We had a question before, I apologize, I forget who asked it, about, uh, it was in the stylometric talk, about applying English research to other languages. I think we do have to be careful, and I, I'm aware of that. Um, word length seems to be much more meaningful in English with some of my pre preliminary results. Uh, Latin word length tends to be pretty consistent. Um, almost all the averages come out to five characters. What I'm finding, though, is the uh, standard deviation uh, tends to get wider as sentences become more complex. So you have a, more of a mix of very long and very short words. So we, we can we can modify we can tweak English formulas. That's what the research going forward is going to do. So the long-term goals uh, for this project, this readability project that I have right now, is one to develop objective measurements for comparing the uh, works, the Latin authors, the genres. Um, and then the second one is to, uh, to have these comparative measures at hand uh, to allow students to be matched with reading materials uh, that are appropriate uh, and also can give them a path to uh, in improvement in reading. And I imagine an autodidact, you know, it was, Greg was just talking about uh, uh, Latin and Greek 101 or language 101. I'm thinking about the 201 level, like the intermediate. Uh, someone's taken a year, uh, hopefully a really good year, they learned a lot. Uh, they, they really can't continue with uh, a formal course. They want to dive into the literature themselves. Right now, it, there are some readers available, uh, but uh, they really just want to pursue their own, like their own interests, order the text for themselves. It would be enormously difficult for them to guess on their own which, which works to read in which order. So I, I'd like to at least have some way of allowing students to, to move through uh, the, the canon with uh, as little difficulty as possible. I, uh, a problem we're going to see as I continue to do this work is that we don't have the kind of benchmark statistics on what is actually hard and difficult for students or really what uh, is expected of them at certain levels. Um, I, I kind of looked through some syllabuses online to get an idea of what people were reading in intermediate Latin. Uh, it was much more efficient for me to just go to Twitter. I have tons of Latin teacher friends. I said, you're teaching intermediate uh, Latin next semester. What do you read? Uh, the first Catalinarian came up. Uh, at almost 50% of the results. I think I had 70 total responses on this, about 80. So uh, it's a small sample, but not, not a terrible one. So I started to think, well, where does, where does the first Catalinarian fit uh, with some brute force application of English readability measures to Latin literature? 
So I was able to adapt the uh, sort of uh, uh, algorithms, the formulas that are used for readability uh, and, and take Python uh, and reproduce them. Take the CLTK and reproduce them. Uh, so I'm going to use the sentence tokenizer, right? Because I need to be able to take a work of Cicero and just get a list of sentences. Uh, I'm going to use the word tokenizer because once I have that list of sentences, I want to get the words per sentence. And you could use out-of-the-box tools. You could use the NLTK, for example, the Natural Language Toolkit. But it, it, gives, it gives you good but not great results on a language in which it was never designed to be used for, right? Um, that's what the Classical Language Toolkit is designed to do, to fill in those gaps where the other tools are, are failing us with uh, historical languages, right? So the, 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 word to the sentence tokenizer I wrote for the CLTK handles um, uh, uh, the names of people, which you may have seen in Latin, like uh, Publius, uh, P period. Well, we don't want sentences tokenized on period if it's just the uh, person's name. The NLTK is great at this for avoiding uh, named entities like USA. It, does, it knows not to uh, tokenize sentences for one sentence U, one sentence S, et cetera. Uh, but I was able to then apply my domain knowledge in Latin to get better sentence tokenization. Same thing with word tokenization. If you look at uh, uh, word lists um, uh, in the t that were generated in the 20th century, you'll see the most common word uh, in Latin, it's not a word at all, it's the enclitic k, right? So uh, the and enclitic that we see at the end of words. Uh, the NLTK doesn't know what to do with that, it doesn't know how to extract that information. And there's also good reasons for wanting to uh, tokenize the enclitics off. We want to increase our feature counts on the words that are at the front of those too. So amorque, Right? We want Amor, and we want the enclitic. So uh, these are the kind of things that the CLTK can improve. Uh, and, and you, there's always a garbage in, garbage out sort of thing in any computer-driven task that you do. So the better we can pre-process our texts, the better our research results are going to be. Uh, and then I can get very quickly and very easily using Python and CLTK all of, I'm sorry, this is kind of small, all of the things I need. I can create definition, uh, functions for sentence count, word count, character count, syllable count. There's an assumption there, just forgive me. Uh, just using vowels to get syllables. Uh, you, it, it, that obviously doesn't work in English. It works okay for Latin. Uh, I can get complicated word count, and we'll get to, the, there's sort of a definition in readability that complicated words are words that are over six letters, or words that are over three syllables, uh, however we define it. This one is, uh, I use the syllable function within the complicated word. Here's, uh, I pulled this from the, the Wikipedia article on the automated readability index. This is, this is the formula, right? Uh, this is what uh, was used. Uh, there's actually a, a fair amount of uh, military, especially military manual context for why uh, we have readability studies developed in the United States in the 20th century. Center and Smith, created the ARI in the, in the late 60s. Uh, before I move on from the slide, I'll say I was thrilled as I was doing uh, my readability research over the last uh, couple of months to find an article by Maria Moritz, uh, Greta Francini, Professor Crane, and, and other uh, people um, involved with global philology uh, that cited at the end of that article saying, uh, this, was, this, was, this was an article on uh, the uh, automated, automated sentence shortening right, to create um, easier sentences for, um, I believe it's for the um, Open Latin Greek project, um, that uh, it, it appealed directly to uh, the ARI as a model for, we should, we should have these statistics at hand. And I was like, yes, I'm, that's great. Uh, <laughs> I can show up here in Leipzig and say, I'm working on it, okay, so I can get you those statistics. Uh, so we go from the, the formula there to a, a, a formalization of that formula, uh, a Python function, which just, and I, these, these coefficients, the, the parameters are nonsense, obviously here, these are, these are uh, tuned for English. Um, that's okay for now, I'm just starting out. I would love to get uh, uh, parameters that are tuned for Latin, for Greek, etc. Um, it, it does seem that, uh, I mean, I, I still get similar results if I just take the parameters out. Uh, so, uh, but I'm just, I'm keeping things simple for now. But we have uh, an, in, uh, a score that's built on character count, built on word count, built on sentence count. Um, and we, we can do this for any of the, the famous uh, readability scores, the Flesh Kincaid, 
Dunning's uh, Files method, uh, the Coleman Lao. We can formalize all of these, and we just are getting the same, the, using the same functions uh, and in different combinations. The CLTK, uh, other Python modules can get us this information rapidly and easily. So I've highlighted, uh, by the way, the Catalinarian in red. So you can see this is all of Cicero's works. Uh, I, I, the data set is the Latin library. I feel like so much blasphemous here. I, I, but I can get that very fast in CLTK these days. So uh, this is just uh, the ARI. Uh, I computed it for all the works that are available for Cicero. And all of those teachers who are signing, uh, if we assume there's any validity in the ARI score, all of those uh, intermediate teachers are, are choosing a work that falls dead in the middle of, of the Ciceronian canon. Uh, I'm not answering questions. I'm introducing the, uh, the uh, points of debate. Uh, so if we go to the front part of the line, we'll see, uh, actually it's a pretty, pretty good pattern that uh, turns up with, uh, it's very small and a little fuzzy. But uh, if you look at what have the lowest uh, ARIs, it's all the letters. The letters just all move right to the front. Uh, the letters, for other reasons, are, have their complications with historical facts and things like that. But uh, from a sentence, uh, at, at a formal feature level, the, uh, the, they, they should be simpler. And I had a little bit of uh, relief in this, too, thinking that I was um, my former Latin teacher, Reginald Foster, has a textbook out now, uh, this, volume two of it, after you complete his 900-page introductory textbook. Uh, the, he, he has a reader of Cicero's letters. That's where he wants to send people. And that was a nice bit of life confirmation <laughs> for himself because I don't think he would approve of my methods here at all. Um, Dale Shaw, I'm running out of time, so I'll move quickly. Dale Shaw is a, a formula that I think we might want to pay a little bit more attention to. It has uh, both a combination of the formal features plus some of the, the very good work that's been done on uh, word difficulty. And here, I, I wind up computing difficult words on uh, Chris Francesi and the Dickinson uh, uh, College team, uh, their Latin core vocabulary. I could have used their other lists available, but this one is available online, open access. Uh, so I know what the thousand most common words, uh, at least in, in this, the text they were using. And I can use that to compute uh, measurements that are based both on formal feature and word frequency. And you'll see this, that's, that's where the Catalinarian fall a little bit better in Dale Chow, uh, up front, but not all the way. So letters, again, uh, mostly fit to the front. So I, I, I put up a provocative teaser that was totally ridiculous, uh, and I apologize for that, but I had to get your attention. What is the hardest sentence in Cicero? Um, and I'm going to throw out there that it might be De Oratoria 3, uh, 202 to 205 already should be setting off some alarm bells. Uh, is this Cicero's hardest sentence? I mean, it's, it's very long. <laughs> uh, how long is it? Uh, it is uh, almost 2,000 characters and uh, almost 300 words. Uh, the, it has a very high character per word count. Uh, and if, honestly, if this was uh, printed as a modern textbook, there's no way this would be a, a sentence or a paragraph. It, it's a list of terms to make his rhetoric easier to understand, or to make one's rhetoric easier to understand. We would totally form, format this as a bulleted list and has words long, like peroratio. Like the, the, the words tend to be longer in this section. Um, it's two pages in the low classical library. It's, it's, it's quite a sentence. Um, but it does, I mean, if you look at this, you know this is not easy, right? OK, so we have some instinct matching uh, what our data is showing us. We have challenges with readability in, uh, in Latin, Greek, in all the languages you have here. We have fewer expert readers and no native readers, at least for Latin. Uh, all of the words, uh, the entire language is learned in a formal context. Almost all readability measures assume that you grow up with the language. Uh, and we have a very compressed timeline for proficiency, which I'd argue is a challenge, but also a reason for doing this. We have so little time with the students that we really want to make the most of it. Uh, and we don't have the data necessary. We don't have enough standardized data uh, to get those coefficients I need. So um, if you have ideas for how we can generate more of that, that would be fantastic. Um, and and I'll, I got I to wrap up here. That's number one. We need criterion passages. We need to find these passages that uh, we can say to a student, this is an easy passage. This is a difficult, so we can have some, um, um, uh, some, some studies to correlate readability that's just formal with student experience.
And then just this is a proviso here. I just wanted to say, I, I know I'm not solving. I'm creating more problems than I'm solving, right? So uh, it must be remembered that readability formulas are only estimates, right? I just want to get this conversation started. So when you're in a room full of other professors, there's some grounding to the conversation. Uh, and so uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Right, and in classic readability research, there are formal arguments, there are student-driven arguments, and then there are sort of these, these para-arguments, like uh, whether or not pictures are on a page. I'm, I'm really so far removed from that. But uh, you're right, This I'm just dealing with formal features at this moment. I don't actually have any data on students. Uh, I, I'd love to get it. I don't know how I'm going to. But uh, yes, it's uh, once we can put those two together, we'll have much more powerful measures, right? Um, I saw another hand in, in the middle. Yes? Yes? My problem with the, your formula is that I think that Latin offers uh, more challenges than English when it comes to reading, especially if you uh, presume that the people who are reading the English text are native speakers mm -hmm. or Anglo children, children in the language. Uh, uh, so, so, in my experience, one of the major challenges of Latin is syntax. Sure. Uh, we have a lot more simple. Yeah. 